Afternoon. Happy to be here. Dayton, I was supposed to come in like three years ago to film for uh, Shirley Murdoch's Unsung episode. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and my flight got canceled because it was storming here and in Chicago at the same time, so it was impossible to make it. Every time you come to Dayton, your flight is canceled. Right, yeah, yeah. But well, I'm finally here in Dayton. Glad of fun. All right. So, I was born in 1973. Now, I always say, you know how you do an internship before you get a job? I always kind of thought maybe I did an internship before I actually started living for real because I have a lot of memories of songs and records that were out before I was even born, <laughs> you know, or when I was one or two years old. Because in the 70s, I was a very observant kid and music was all around me. My entire family was into music. Everybody had records. I was in the room with the radio by myself. I mean, all this type of stuff. But one thing, I noticed that a lot of times I would see music before I would hear it. Sometimes I would hear it and then I would see it and I would recognize like, oh yeah, I know that. Because album cover art was very important at that time. These days, you know, with streaming, you know, some people put out albums, they don't have any artwork at all, <laughs> you know. But in the 70s, that wasn't the case. And so, as a person who started collecting records when I was like five years old, and has been collecting since then, uh, I noticed that there were certain themes that bands tended to explore with the type of artwork they did in their albums. And because I noticed that, I really wanted to present that today. So one thing that I noticed is band branding. Most bands back in the day had a logo and their albums typically had that same logo, but certain bands took it beyond that. So let me see if we can get this one up here. So one of my favorite bands and one of the earliest images I ever saw was this BT Express album, Do It Till You're Satisfied. This is the exact copy my parents had at home. Mm. And the thing about this, when, when you hear the name BT Express, yeah, they had the logo, they really wanted to emphasize the, the train aspect of it. So they're waiting at the train station, and to this day, if, if I ever take public transportation, I always kind of think of this record, because I'm looking to see if it's coming, just like they are on the album cover. And one thing about it, I noticed that there's a, I don't know if you can see it on this picture. Let me go to a different image here. There's a jacket hanging up in the, in the oh, yeah. corner here. Mm -hmm. And when you open the gatefold up, there's the jacket again. Mm -hmm. On the back, you see the train leaving. So I always wondered as a kid, they did remember to get the jacket before they left. I always wondered that. Not sure if they did or not. But the train aspect, they kept that going for the next album as well. So this time, instead of them just simply waiting for the train, they actually go to the more traditional train, you know, older trains, where they're actually on the train tracks. And you get, with the nonstop, you get the green light, you get red light. So they really on this train thing. And then on the back, they're walking on the train tracks and everything. So they really utilize that to emphasize who they were as BT Express. Now another band that was tied into them, they had the same producer and were also from Brooklyn, New York, was Brass Construction. Another one of my favorite and their very first album, what did they do to show they were brass construction? Well, they went to a construction site. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can't mistake that. And on the back, you see them all on the construction site. They got their own pictures. And then the second album, they just emphasized the logo. However, with their third release, uh, creatively entitled Brass Construction 3, I mean, hey, they kept it simple. Two, three, I mean, you can't mistake anything. But what did they do? They used a construction hat, all right? And on the back of it, they actually have smaller images of the band members 
playing around on this hat. So you know they're brass construction. There's no mistake in that. All right, another band who did something similar with their name was the band Brick. However, there are conflicting stories about how they got their name. One story says that they were originally called Acapulco Brick. And this album cover kind of confirms that. I was fortunate enough to get this one autographed by Jimmy Brown, who you see pictured on here, and Reggie, Reggie Hardis, Hardis, the uh, guitar player, who just recently passed away. But if you look at this, you see the, the cannabis signs on the brick. He's got the brick, he looks like he's high, you know? And then on the back, he's like floating up in the air, and the band members are looking up at him, so it's a good high, all right? There's a conflicting story. The other story, though, is that they got their name from a pile of bricks that was in one of the band members' backyard. And this particular image from their second album, classic album, by the way, shows that that's what maybe that's where they got the name from. They're standing up against the brick wall. They just kept it simple, and it's entitled Brick. And as great as this album is, they didn't need anything else. All right. Another artist who kind of utilized the his name and image for an album is Bootsy Collins. Bootsy's Rubber Band, one of the great bands. All right. When you think of Bootsy Collins, what do you tend to think of image-wise? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Hi, she said, I hear boots. <laughs> star glasses. Yeah, there we go, star glasses. So with Bootsy's third album, they utilized the star glasses to market him. All right. And you see the glasses right there. But not only did you get to see the glass on the outside? Anybody who bought this record, what do you remember most about it from the cover? Anybody remember? Well, when you open it up, you got to get your own set of Bootsy glasses. Okay. Yeah, see, I kept these in the cover. And fortunately for me, I've been able to meet most of these guys, so I have seven of the 10 original band members' autographs on this album, along with George Clinton. So, all right. Now, another theme that I noticed in funk album covers is what I call funk is fun, all right? George Clinton describes funk as fun with a K, and there were certain album covers that kind of typify what that is, all right? And one of them is Rufus featuring Shaka Khan, their third album, Rufusized. All right. If you look at the image, they on there. It looks. Does it look like they had a good time? Or yeah. having a good time? Yeah. They smiling. They laughing. You know. And this is a great example of that. So, and on the back, you see they had a whole photo shoot going on. <laughs> All right. So, not only do you get the one, and then when you open it up. You see Shaka by herself, what is she doing? She's smiling, laughing, having a good time. So it, gives, it gave the impression that this is fun music that you should have, all right? Another one of my favorite funk is fun images comes from 1977. This is one that I saw a lot when I was a kid. Both my, some of my cousins had this album. It's the Bar Case. Flying high on your love. Now, if you look at that cover, you see not only does it look like they're having fun, it's like they, it's almost like they're talking to you. They tell you, like, yeah, yeah, man. oh, this is, you know you want to get this record. This is bad. You know, they, they ah, they do the poses, everybody's mouth is open, like, ah. So when I saw this as a kid, I'm like, this must be a really good record. And I <laughs> and it is. It turned out it worked because this was the first gold album they ever had. And it's one of the best, the best as far as I'm concerned. And again, I was fortunate enough to get this autograph by James Alexander, the bass player and leader, and Larry Dotson, the lead singer. Now, two years later, 
The Barquets, they were on Mercury, and one of their label mates and somewhat rivals was another band, Confunction. And just like how the Barquets, that Flying High on Your Love, might have been their best album, Confunction's best album might have been Candy from 1979. The Candy image was just there and, and it disappeared. Oh, there it is. All right. So, like the Barquets, again, look at the expressions on these guys' faces. Yeah, they got the hands, they, oh, yeah, you got to get this record, this is bad, you know. And when you opened it up, the cake folk, you got to see the lady with the candy. And who doesn't like candy? <laughs> I mean, unless you get to a point you just can't have too many sweets. But outside from that, you like candy. So this also gave the impression that funk is fun and it's something you want to be a part of and you want to get this record. And this is another one I got, was fortunate to get autographed by Felton Pilot, Michael Cooper, and Carl Fuller, who is in the lower right hand, who if you look at any confunction album, Carl always had the coolest pose. He's like, yeah, yeah, you know. So another funk is fun out, all right? Now another thing that I noticed is what I call space is the place. As you all know in the 70s, you had Star Wars, you had all of this stuff going on. So the space theme was pretty common in the late 70s in particular. So there are several album covers that I noticed uh, explore that theme. And one of the, the first one we're gonna look at is from the New Orleans funk band, Chocolate Milk. They're one of the more underrated bands. So you see, this is actually their fifth album. So they had been around for a few years by the time they got to this, and they did Milky Way. And you have the lady in space, she's like an astronaut. The fact that she's topless, we won't focus on that, but in the 70s, that was you know, not outrageous. But again, it explores the space theme. They got the chocolate milk spelled out like it's you know, kind of spacey. You got the rocket ships, the planets, so Space is the Place was something that was explored in that. Another band who explored something similar to that, right here in Dayton, the band Phase O. And their first album, Riding High. Now with Riding High, you don't have a whole lot going on on the album cover. But it obviously has the space theme. You got the, the planet, the Saturn for the old. You know, you got the black background. The, the logo is kind of, seems like it's a spaceship almost that's riding. So Riding High explores this theme as well. Another band here from Dayton who used a similar kind of space image is the band Sun. Now, Sun, for this particular album, they actually used the same graphic artist or illustrator that Earth, Wind & Fire used for a lot of their albums. A Japanese gentleman, uh, Shuzi Nagaoki, um, may not be pronouncing it right, but he did Earth, Wind & Fire's All In All, I Am, Bray, several of their albums. Well, uh, he did a lot of other albums covers as well for people like uh, Electric Light Orchestra, did uh, Parlette, who's a spin-off group for Parliament Funkadelic. And for Sun, he did this particular album. They were coming off their biggest album, which was Sunburn, that had gone gold. So they may have been given a little bit more of a budget for this particular album. And they used it to get a space-themed album cover. You have a spaceship, you can see the different crew people on there. They're really small, but you look at the album cover, you see that they are part of this whole space movement. And then with their next album, they took it a little bit further. The album Sun Over the Universe. And for this one, 
I believe this image is actually taken from like one of the spacecrafts at the time, and they used, they were able to use it for the cover. But clearly, this is a space image. The sun, you see the planets and the sun and all that in the background. Now, the thing about it though is you don't have to be in the darkness if you're out of space. You can still be up in the air, but maybe it's during the daytime. So there's another thing that I call uh, what was the name? Oh, high in the sky, okay? Not getting high, but just looking like you're up in the sky and you got, you know, the, the daytime element to it. So one of the first album covers that explores that is Earth, Wind, and Fires Open Our Eyes. Now, what's interesting about this one is that the story goes, they actually, you know, they were recording in Colorado up in the Caribou Mountains, and they went outside and took this album cover picture. And according to Verdine White, you may not notice it, but he said they were freezing to death when they took this picture. He said their noses were running, because they got these little, these are outfits they wore on stage. You know, they, these aren't outfits that you wear when it's, you know, 20, 30 degrees outside. But apparently that's what they did. They were freezing to death, but it works because it ties into their whole imagery that they were kind of forming at that time. And you see them outside high in the sky, all right? Another image, this is one that I really remember as a kid that ties into the high in the sky, is the Brothers Johnson debut album, Look Out for Number One. So again, you have the brothers. And one of the things that I remember about this album cover is the expressions on their faces that, that really caught me. You got the brother with the big afro, George Johnson, he's on there like, and then you got Lewis, and he's like, yeah. you know? So as a kid, it, it actually, the original version says Quincy Jones presents at the top. Let me see if I can get an image with that one. And you can't really see it that good, but it says Quincy Jones presents right over where it says the Brothers Johnson look out for number one. Now, as a little kid, I didn't know who Quincy Jones was, but I knew whoever he was, he must have been bad to present these guys because they looked like they were bad, okay, in a good way. And I remember looking at the album cover and reading the, the titles, and, uh, I'll be good to you. Yeah, okay, get the funk out of my face. Yeah, I know that song. Yeah, so I was excited to see this, and this has always been one of my favorites, and got to get it autographed by uh, George Johnson a few years back. Another high in the sky image is the Commodores from the following year, 1977. Now, some people will argue that this is their best album. I say it's the one before that, but either way, you have the Commodore's logo just kind of flying high in the sky, you know, and then on the back, you see them doing the same thing with the, the background image. And then my favorite, and I think one of the more creative ones along this thing, is a band out of Virginia called Mass Production. They're best known for the hit Firecracker in 1979. But the album they did before that may be their best one. And, oh, that's not what I wanted. The album is called Three Miles High. Now, what's interesting about this, I'm going to show you, this is, what you see up there is the front cover, but this is the back cover. It's just the plain clouds in the sky. But on the front, you see their image, but they incorporated, they use an effect to put the clouds on their bodies instead of seeing their clothes. And you see it kind of in the background of the logo as well. So they're showing you that they're in the sky and they're gonna put it actually on their bodies. So they're taking it to a whole other level right there. All right. Now another theme that I found in album covers is what I call cartoon fantasies. And as a kid, I always loved when album covers had cartoons on them because it, it kind of tied into, you know, the type of stuff you would see as a little kid. So one of my all-time favorite albums is the Rick James album, 
busting out of L7. This is his second release. And in terms of an image, to me, this was his best album cover. So you see the image of Rick being drawn. He's like superhero. He's got his guitar up in the air, almost like Superman or something. He's got the girls chasing him, you know. And I happened to meet Rick James and Tina Marie the night, uh, Halloween night of 2003. And one of the interesting things that Tina Marie told me is that the girl who's on the far left, she said that she used to tell people that that was supposed to be her even though it really wasn't, but she said that's what she told people and everybody believed her. So she signed that part of the album cover and Rick signed it as well, all right? Another interesting cartoon, this one kind of combines cartoon imagery and real imagery. It's the second album from Cameo, We All Know Who We Are. So what they did with this one is on the front cover, you see them and they have these animal heads. These, these are the animal heads of drawings. So you see them and you're like, okay, who are these cats? But then when you turn it over, you see the actual picture of the band members. So one of the fun things with this one is you can kind of keep flipping it back and forth and trying to figure out who's who. Okay, who's the, the zebra? Okay, oh, okay, that's the zebra. Who's the, the lion? Okay, there's the lion. You know, you can kind of have fun with this and as a kid, you know, you can't miss with that. Another cartoon image that was really big when I saw this as a kid was another band based right here in Dayton, Heat Wave. And their debut album, Too Hot to Handle. Now what's interesting is they had a different cover for this for the British release, but the one that was released here in America looked like this. And I remember seeing this record over my cousin's house. I remember thinking, wow, it must really be hot out there. <laughs> the record is melting. The fire hydrant is melting. I mean, I don't want to be out there. You know, give me somewhere with some air conditioning or something. But this was a great example of using cartoon imagery to emphasize the band. It's heat wave, it's too hot to handle, and you can visually see that with the cover. The band who probably took it to the highest level in terms of using cartoon image, imagery is another band, straight out of Dayton, Lakeside. Now Lakeside, their first album, the first album cover was pretty basic on uh, ABC Records, but once they went to Solar and got with Dick Griffey, they came up with the whole image of having different cartoons and having them be different characters. And I remember their unsung episode was actually the very first one that I appeared in in 2015, which I thought was fitting, the first episode I'd be in would be a phone man. So one of the comments I remember Steve Shockley making was that Dick Griffey, the head of that label, told them, said, don't nobody care about nine fools standing on some stairs. <laughs> said, you got to make nine fools look interesting. So they came up with, the Shot of Love album cover, where they're all in this Robin Hood kind of gear, and you know, they got the beard, and you got the dogs on the back, they're shooting arrows at the, the Indian ladies, and you know, so they, they did a good job with this, but they didn't stop there. They kind of turned that into a whole theme where every album cover did something like that. So their second album, Rough Riders, instead of them being Robin Hood's Merry Men, they become cowboys. All right? So, right here, they're cowboys. And the cool thing about this is with this particular album, they got a gatefold cover. So you can open it up and see the whole band instead of just, with this image, you see half the band. With this one, you see everybody. And then when you open it up, you also see them dressed as cowboys. So you get the drawing and you get them, and they said they had a lot of fun with this, you know, that particular day, going to this photo shoot and doing all of this. And the most famous one they did for their biggest album came next, and this is the one that I remember the most as a kid, was Fantastic Voyage. And of course with this one, they were pirates. So 
get the pirate imagery on the outside. And again, if you open the whole album up, you see the whole band, you see the captain, you, they got dogs on there, you know, they got, you know, cats swinging off ropes. I mean, they, they just having a good time with this. But then also, you see on the inside where the whole band is dressed up as pirates. So you get the, this was like double fun as a kid. You get the cartoon and you get the real guys dressed up like pirates. It, it didn't get any better. Now, apparently the, the Funk Hall of Fame is inducting three major artists first. And one of them, of course, is the godfather of soul, James Brown. Now, James Brown obviously had a very long career. So if you look at his albums, he did like one album in the 50s. He did a lot of albums, a lot of albums in the 60s. Most of those album covers are pretty basic. You know, it's just pictures of James singing on stage, performing, what have you. But when you got to the 70s, his album covers started to take on some political themes. So one of the albums is from 1972, There It Is. Now, the front cover is just James Brown, a drawing. That's pretty basic, nothing special about that. But on the back of the album cover, they got an image of it on Okay, ah, there it is. On the back of the album cover, he tackles the heroin problem that was plaguing America in the early 70s. So he's got the white horse with the needle. You see the people on the United States map, they're kind of looking like zombies. The white horse is dropping the heroin packets. And he's observing this, you know. So he's, he, and this was the album that had the song King Heroin, and he did a song called Public Enemy Number One. Uh, he didn't write King Heroin. A uh, guy who was actually in prison wrote those lyrics, but he did Public Enemy Number One as his own personal response, and it was such a big thing for him, he actually had to split it up into two parts that are both like over five minutes long. So he really cared about this particular problem that was plaguing the country at that time. Another issue that he tackled is something that people have been talking about a lot recently, in recent years, is the theme of reparations. And he explores that in a couple of album covers. So the first one where he tackles it is the classic, The Payback. So in this payback image right here, you see the big drawing of him, but you also see the hands exchanging money, okay? And on the inside, there's a picture of a farmer on a farm, and they talk about the whole 40 acres and a mule thing. So he goes into this a little bit with his album covers. During the same session where they were recording that payback album, Fred Wesley and the JBs were doing the album Damn right I'm somebody. And it explores that same theme kind of from a different angle. And we'll get that one up here. So this particular cover goes into it a little bit differently. He's got kind of the, the slavery images, he's got chains breaking. You know, again, people on the farm working. He's got the devil exorcist, which perhaps leads towards exercising these particular demons. Because on the back of the cover, it says positive thinking. Think that you are somebody, you'll be somebody. There's no illustration, but he, he has that on here constantly. But with the imagery, it kind of ties into the previous album. And this is when I was fortunate to meet Fred Wesley, Maceo, and Fred Thomas bass player, yeah, if you listen to Doing It to Death, where he says, uh, I believe in Fred Thomas, brother. I met Fred Thomas. I was like, yeah, that's Fred Thomas. <laughs> you know? but I love meeting those kind of guys, you know. Now, another album cover he did right after that same year explores some problems that were taking place at the time. And that's the album Hell. So this is an album 
Well, if you look at the cover, there are a lot of different things going on here. Okay, so he's got uh, the guy right underneath hell. You see, the guy has a gun to his head. That's actually from a scene, uh, a scene from the movie Shaft's Big Score, the second Shaft. There's a guy who's a numbers runner. And he's going to these apartments, and Shaft stops him and points the gun at his head. And I noticed that because I'm a black movie aficionado for 70s, so I caught that. But you see, he's got the Watergate tapes. He's got the gas shortage that was going on at that time. Uh, you got people homeless. You got the needles. So all of this is happening at the time. And the Vietnam veteran, he's probably a war veteran from Vietnam, all of that's happening in this particular album cover. And then he kind of does something slightly similar with the next one, which was uh, Reality. This was actually the first album where he's, his hit streak kind of died out. It has Funky President, which was a big record, but that was really the last big album he had. But if you look at the cover, it kind of has, it's a similar thing. You got a big picture of him, but then you have the bus representing school busing. You have, uh, Lower right hand corner, maybe left hand corner, there's somebody with a gun, you got rats, you know, fires, so all of this turmoil that's happening at the time. And then on the back, they actually have an image of, I believe that was the Memphis garbage strike uh, that happened where Dr. King ended up going down there. So they tackle all of these different things in the album cover. Now, I have a particular theory when it comes to meeting men. I've always said this for many years. Never, ever trust any man who says he does not like the Ohio players. <laughs> you know, anytime somebody tells you, I'm like, they had the great songs. They had the coolest nicknames. They, they, it's the coolest band ever, okay? The nicknames. Sugarfoot, Satch, Dad, Merv. I mean, they, they, they were just cool. But one of the things I've noticed is that in their album covers, they tended to show you what the album was about by the image, so the title tied in with it, okay? So the first Ohio Players album that people really know is Pain. And there's the image of the ball here, lady, with the whip in her hand. But if you expand the album, I always love this how if you expand it, you get another image. So you got the guy, and he looks like he's in some kind of pain. <laughs> okay. And inside, they got the whip, so they letting you know. All right. Then the next album they did was Pleasure. All right. If you look at Pleasure, you get the same lady, and this time she's got she's in the chains. see her, you don't really see what's going on when you just look at the front cover. But then when you expand it, now you got some extra going on, all right? And then, of course, they took it to the next step. We went from pain to pleasure to ecstasy. And the fun thing about this particular image, again, you don't really know what's happening right away. It just looks normal. You got a guy and a lady. Then all of a sudden, wait a minute, where'd this other guy come from? And it kind of looks similar, so it's like, is that his brother? I mean, like, you don't know what's going on there, all right? But here's an interesting thing here. Perhaps this story can be confirmed. It has not been, but the rumor is that when the Ohio players left Westbound, Westbound was not very happy about it, and they put this particular album together, Climax, which again, looks like just a regular man and a woman together. But then when you expand it, you see the woman is stabbing the guy in the back with the knife. And the rumor is that that was the record company's way of calling the band backstabbers for leaving them. Is that, is that true? We got Diamond right here. He's shaking his head and saying, yeah, okay. But that confirms it. But obviously when they went to Mercury, then the images change a little bit. So they did skin tight, had a lady with some boots. But then when they did fire, you look at the image of this, 
And you see the lady with the fire hose. She's got the number one. I went to number one, so that's perfect on time. You don't really get a surprise when you open it up, but it's just more of the same lady. You know, and then on the inside, you actually get to see her face, and you see the band members and all the cool poses, and you see their nicknames. And of course, perhaps the greatest album cover of all time, definitely gets my vote, is Honey. Now, as a kid, I had never seen a naked woman before in this album cover. But once I saw this, Wow, and I, and I remember being really proud because I heard the song Sweet Sticky Thing. When I saw this album at my aunt's house, I, I automatically knew that was on this album. <laughs> you know, and then of course you open it up, and then we all know the legendary image of the lady on the inside with the honey on her. All right, so and that's why I say you can't trust the man who doesn't like the Ohio players because I mean, what is there to not like? So finally, we're gonna wrap up with a band who kind of embodied a lot of these different things, and that's Parliament Funkadelic. Now, they did some political images early on. One of them is the album America Eats Its Young. So they have this image of this dollar bill and they have the Statue of Liberty. Now, when you open it up, you get the whole image there, the whole dollar bill. This is probably the scariest album they did, as far as I'm concerned. A lot of people say it's Maggie Brain. Nah, this is scary because they got some wild stuff going on in this record. But on the image, you see the Statue of Liberty eating the baby. She's got the red demonic eyes. It's like, wow. You know, instead of holding the, the things she normally has, she's got the kids. So this is really a commentary on what was happening at the time from Funkadelic, all right? Another political theme they used is a better known album, One Nation Under a Groove. Now, if you were to Google, well, as a matter of fact, I'll do it real quick. If you Google I Iwo Jima, you see, this image where the soldiers posting up the flag, all right? Well, Funkadelic used that similar image for their album cover for One Nation Under Group. You see the drawing, they got instead of the United States flag, they got Army, they got these kind of funked out guys with the guitar, you got the lady, and they're doing a similar thing, and they have the, their flag at the bottom. So they used politics on that. Another famous image is the Huey P. Newton Black Panther Party poster. All right, you see Huey Newton sitting in the chair. There he is. He's got the, the gun and the spear and all of this. So George Clinton adapted that image for their album cover, Uncle Jam Wants You. So you see, you see George sitting in the chair. Instead of the traditional gun, he's got his bot gun and flashlight from Parliament to represent the same thing. So instead of you know the Black Panther Party had more you know a different type of image, George kind of uses that to show that they were rescuing dance music from the blah, sort of a war on disco. Marcus, I hate to interrupt you. This is so interesting and entertaining too. But we've got to wrap up because okay. I've got people in line on online waiting right. to start. Okay. Well, can I do one more? Sure. I have to say while you're getting it out that tonight at the concert you'll find out that I was in backup orchestra for um, for um, <laughs> well, help me out here. Isaac Hayes. Isaac Hayes. Thank you. In the in the early '70s. And um, when they hired string players and woodwind players to back up his band, and the bald-headed lady was always there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Person, uh, with a spotlight on her head. Okay, okay. And other things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on the flip side of Fungadelic, we had Parliament. And of 
course, the ultimate space image is one you all are very familiar with, Mothership Connection. So this is the one that kind of starts the whole space imagery thing in album covers. Classic Mothership Connection right there. But as a kid, I was always more interested in the back cover because he landed somewhere. Where did he land? I've always wanted to know, where is this supposed to, is it? Y'all remember looking at, oh, see, I see a California address. Maybe he's in California. I don't know. But the fact that he landed and he, he's got this look on his face, like, yeah. <laughs> like, you know this is an album that you want to have, all right? And the final album I'll show is also my all-time favorite album, so I can't just not show this one. It's Parliament's 1978 effort, and it's best known for the song Aqua Boogie. And this one features drawings by Overton Lloyd. Now, it's a basic image. You got Sir Nose, who was introduced on the previous album. You got the bird from Aqua Boogie. And on the back, you get to see the girls going to this festival. You know, I never paid attention to women's bodies until I really saw this as a little kid. Uh, but the interesting thing, when you open it up, you got this, you got this whole scene going on at this underwater party. You got this pop-up Atlantis. They even gave you like extra little characters in the album. You know, you got these. And I actually tried, when I was a kid, I actually popped these out and tried to play with them in the bad to ruin them because we're supposed to be on the water. I didn't know. I'm wild. I don't know. You know. But the fact that Overton Lloyd was able to do this and have all of these different drawings and then on the next album he actually turned the whole cover into a comic book. So not only do you open it up one time, you got a whole other pattern. I spent hours looking at these things and drawing these things myself and they have an egg on the back and I actually took an egg out of my mom's uh, out of the refrigerator, roll on it, and threw it on the ground to try to make it look like Parliament. Uh, I have been a uh, Now we got to try to connect to uh, D'Angela Duff from NYU. He told me he didn't have clothes in his suitcase. He was right. Yeah, the clothes they don't. <laughs> yeah, specially for specifically for the album. 